All right, this is the last video on pedigrees. We're calling this part three, and we're going to do some practice here. So to your right, I have a pedigree, and this is of a family called the Fugates from Troublesome Creek in Kentucky. And they had a disorder <coughs> called, um, well, it was a, an enzyme disorder. And the result was it gave their skin a bluish cast. I'm going to share my screen and show you a picture of... Uh, a gentleman. So this gentleman was from the region and you can see that his skin is indeed blue. So what causes that? Well, excuse me one second. There's a genetic condition where you have, um, there's a recessive trait. And uh, when you have it, it causes your hemoglobin, your, your pink because your blood is red and it shows through your skin. And it's, your blood is red because of a compound called um, heme in, in, in hemoglobin. And for this family, they had more something called uh, methemoglobin than they did hemoglobin. And methemoglobin is blue. And so their blood had a bluish tint, which gave their skin a bluish tint. Now, this was only found within a two to three county area in Kentucky. So we'll talk about the implications for that later. <clears throat> but here I have a pedigree. Now, the first thing you want to, I think the easiest thing to determine is, is it sex linked? Now, remember the, the circles and the squares that are filled in are afflicted. So hopefully you can see this is not sex linked because I have an equal number of women and men that have the disorder. <clears throat> now, the question is, is it dominant or is it recessive? Well, I kind of already told you it was recessive, but how could we know that? So we're skipping a generation here. This generation does not have the disease. And then we see this generation that does. Here we have uh, two parents and they have a total of seven offspring. This says, it's a little hard to read. Just remember, you can get this handout on, on my Teachers Pay Teachers website for free. So this whole packet comes and you can, you can download it. But this says three normal boys, three normal girls, and then they had a daughter that had the disease. So they had seven children in total and only one had the disease. Well, that means they had to be heterozygous and that this gal got homozygous recessive. Also, once again, you'll see we've got a little bit of weirdness going on with this pedigree. You have a husband and a wife or a couple. And <clears throat> this does not mean they're married because this comes up above and it has a line. This, that means these are sisters. So this couple has two sons, a son, three sons and a daughter. But what happens then? Their son marries her sister. What relationship is that? Well, yeah, that's the aunt. So the first thing it says is, uh, let's write down the genotypes for as many individuals as possible. Uh, it doesn't tell us what letter to use. So let's say that um, lowercase b is going to be blue and uppercase b is going to be normal. So we know that all of these people, we know that we're um, uh, this is going to be um, autosomal recessive autosomal recessive. So this is going to be a lowercase b, lowercase b, b, and b. So we said that if this gal has the disease, but her mom and dad are normal, they have to be carriers. And notice it said, let me do this in black so I stay consistent with my coloring. We said the carriers were not filled in here. And we have the same thing going on here, correct? Because we have two normal parents, but three, uh, two of their sons have the disease and one of them is a carrier. So that means that these guys also have to be carriers. Luckily, here we finally brought somebody in from outside the family to marry in. But think about, uh, pause the video if you need to, what are going to be the um, genotypes for these guys. Did you say that this guy has to be a carrier? If you did, you're correct because this is homozygous recessive. If he was homozygous dominant, they could not have a daughter that has the disease. So the other possibility, then the other thing we know is that, so let's write in that genotype, capital B, lowercase b, and all of these are gonna be heterozygous then. Uh, 
this one we don't know because she didn't have offspring. So this one is either going to be, could be either or. But then what do we know about this guy? Four, two. Well, he could have gotten a regular allele. Well, he did get uh, the um, dominant allele from his dad, but his mom, he had to have gotten a recessive. So also a carrier. All right, pause the video and let's go through the rest of these, uh, look at the questions and then we'll go over the answers. All right, did you pause the video? All right, so they say, what are the genotypes and phenotypes for Roman numeral one, two and Roman numeral one, three? So if I'm looking at, this is Roman numeral one and I, I crossed it off, but this was number two. So the genotype here was BB and they were normal is the phenotype. And for one, three, we have the same. One, two, and one, three. What is the relationship between one, one, and one, two? So that would be here, switch colors, here and here. So what did we say that was? That was aunt and nephew. Yep, this is his aunt. Complete opponent square for one, one, and one, two. What percent of their offspring was predicted to be blue? So we have two uh, heterozygous, one, one, and one, two. I'm sorry, two, two. Then we've done this many times before. This is our typical heterozygous cross where we say 25% of the offspring should be blue. But what actual percent was blue? Well, they had three boys, three girls, and one child that had the blue, disease, the blue disorder. So they actually only had one out of seven. And when I divide that out, grab my calculator, I know what one divided by eight is. I'm not sure what one divided by seven is. That is 14%. So they should have potentially had 25% offspring that were blue, but they only had 14%. So in a way you could say their kids kind of beat the odds. So then the last question said, this trait, this trait was only widespread within a two to three county area in Kentucky. Give a hypothesis, give a hypothesis for why this was the case. Well, remember what happened with uh, Cleopatra and in, in we had uh, uh, problems by you know marrying within the family. So there was a very small population within this, this area and they tended to not leave. And so they married cousins and they married aunts and uncles, hopefully not brothers and sisters, although it probably happened. And so what you had was you had this trait for uh, 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 methoglobin getting um, passed around between this very small group of people. And by the way, that the, this is called a gene pool. So we call this a gene pool. And a gene pool, we would say, are the available, this doesn't have to be people, it can be um, squirrels, it could be dogs. So the available um, members of a population that can reproduce. And what you're seeing is there's a problem if you have a small gene pool, because if you have a bad trait, it just keeps getting bounced around and you don't get, you don't get rid of it. Um, I live in a rural county and we have some minor um, genetic issues uh, that exist in this county because we have a very small population. We have a smaller gene pool it's nothing to this degree, you know, it's nothing as, as detrimental as this, although people with this disorder, uh, methoglobin could live, but, uh, it, it's, it's good to, to have a big gene pool. So again, we talked about variation back in the last chapter. It's good to have variation. It, it lets these bad traits not get so concentrated. All right. And that wraps up pedigree that wraps up this chapter. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next chapter.